This meeting is being recorded. Good morning. We'll take a few seconds uh, to let the Zoom room populate before we get started. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. Thank you all for joining us today. This is our sixth and final committee meeting of 2022. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to briefly welcome Assembly Member Isaac Bryan to the Penal Code Committee. Assembly Member Bryan was recently appointed to the committee, and we look forward to a productive meeting today and working together in the future. Welcome to the team. Great. To um, great. Uh, let's begin with a quick roll call in alphabetical order. Assemblymember Bryan. Here. Judge Espinoza. I'm here. Judge Henderson. Here. Justice Moreno. Here. Senator Skinner. Here. Great. Right. Full House. Uh, today we're going to move in three parts. First, we'll hear from Tino Cuellar, who is president of the Carnegie Endowment. But more pertinently, for our purposes, he's a former justice of the California Supreme Court and author of the court's unanimous decision on cash bail in Imre Humphrey. We're extremely grateful to Justice Cuellar for giving us his time today. Uh, then we will discuss our draft annual report and recommendations for 2022 and vote on whether to adopt the draft and report and any needed changes to it. Finally, we'll have a brief discussion on topics to study for next year. And of course, we'll have public comment. All right. To get started with today's agenda, I'm extremely happy to introduce Tino Cuellar, who is the current president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Before joining the Carnegie Endowment last year, he was associate justice on the California Supreme Court and a law professor at Stanford Law School. While on our Supreme Court, he wrote the unanimous opinion on, in Ray Humphrey, as I mentioned, and which we discussed at some length at our last committee hearing. We've asked Justice Cuellar to briefly address the committee about Humphrey, and he's also agreed to answer a few questions from the committee members. So again, thank you so much, Justice Cuellar, for being here. Please take us take it away. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, uh, members. It's really a pleasure to have the chance to join you. I know you are in a very crucial position for California, and what you've been asked to do is critical for all of us who care about the state. Frankly, one important takeaway, which maybe will serve to frame my comments, is that we're probably all gathered in some sense because we realize that our criminal justice system is a powerful source of impact for all of us, whether we're uh, people who are affected by criminal activity or by having family ties and connections to people who are pulled into the criminal justice process, or as we all do, live in communities surrounded by people who fall into those categories. So um, my time on the Supreme Court was one of the great privileges of my life. I had a chance to serve with extraordinary people, amazing colleagues who came with the background of being trial court judges in some cases, or fellow academics, or practitioners or state of, uh, and federal law. And I found that one of the greatest um, opportunities being on the court was to constantly learn from these folks who had a particular view of the law, the legal system, its challenges that spanned really the entire state. I grew up in uh, beginning in Southern California and the Imperial Valley, but later on had a chance to live um, in other parts of the state. And it does feel to me like when we deal with pretrial detention, criminal justice issues, we're trying to hold together an incredibly diverse and complicated jurisdiction that has um, all the challenges of many, many big states, but also something that I'd like to think of as very quintessential about California, which is an ambition to always be better to do better than previous generations, whether it's how we do pre-trial detention or do policing or how we think about education and so on. So in that spirit, I will share with you just uh, four brief thoughts about the Humphrey case, its context, its significance, and then I'll very much welcome the chance for some discussion. The first thing I'll note is that when the Humphrey case came to the Supreme Court of California, it percolated up from one of our courts of appeal and it came to us at a time when it was painfully clear to everybody, certainly in our justice system, that pretrial detention is always difficult. This is not a uniquely California thing. The reality is that when, you, if you think about it for a moment, what you're trying to do with pretrial detention in principle, in a democracy, in a country that cares about the rule of law, 
is you're trying to make a judgment about somebody without having had the full measure of fact finding that we consider court to making a decision about whether somebody should be subject to punishment. It's not a punishment, but it therefore implicates just by its nature, a judgment that is being made in lieu of a completely open and shut determination about whether somebody merits punishment and therefore detention on that basis. So you're you're dealing with incomplete information, you're dealing with uncertainty. And amidst that context, there's another crucial point, which is every jurisdiction across the country, and California is no exception, approaches that difficult judgment. Like, how do you, on the one hand, put the state in a position to coerce people, but at the same time recognize that you have incomplete and indeterminate information? Just about every state does that in subtly different ways. So when social scientists sometimes go and try to compare jurisdictions like New York, California, Michigan, South Carolina, they often airbrush out all those subtle distinctions that live in statutes, but often in constitutional provisions that are supposed to have a bearing on what exactly is a trial court judge supposed to be doing when she is presented with this dilemma of not having enough information to determine if somebody's guilty or not. There hasn't been a trial, there hasn't been a plea bargain, but at the same time, having to decide whether this person should be detained or not. That's point number one. Point number two is that you got to read Humphrey in connection with a white case, which was decided a little bit before, and deals with the reality that California judges were struggling for a little bit more clarity, not only with respect to, um, you know, whether it was legally appropriate to deny uh, bail simply because somebody had an inability to pay. And we're struggling with that question alongside a related question, which is like, when can you detain somebody? Can somebody be detained? And if so, in what circumstances, given a set of overlapping constitutional provisions that raised interesting and really intricate questions about certain fact patterns, at least, that were not 100% clear. So in both White and Humphrey, the court struggled to bring, I would argue, and the opinions say as much, some clarity to these questions. And clarity is a key word because, look, you know, we have 2,000 plus bench officers all over California, and they're... A, a, a very large proportion of them are dealing with criminal justice and are trying to make these decisions day in, day out, without staff, without a ton of data, without a ton of information. So uh, in the end, we granted review on Humphrey because we viewed it as valuable and important to go um, perhaps a little bit further than any court of appeal could go in saying, what is the baseline? What can we see right now in these facts about what authority a trial court judge has to deal with tricky, difficult situations involving pretrial detention? And in the end, I think you could say one reason our process in the Supreme Court is valuable is because any one of us any, who is a justice can start with a set of ideas about what is completely necessary to do. But as Justice Moreno knows well, it's in the dialogue and the back and forth that you often come to narrow the ambitions of a case and to focus a bit more on something very concrete. And here I would say the back and forth reinforced the tendency that we all tend to have, which is to just not go too far, to go as far as we reasonably could and not necessarily to bite off the entire challenge of defining every provision in the California Constitution that has some arguable bearing on the question of pretrial detention. Now, here, let me note two other quick points. Uh, one is that, of course, in a system of shared powers, and one of the reasons we have here, former justices as well as legislators, is the legislature has a really important role to play that all of us ought to respect and recognize. And we were trying to work through the Humphrey case against the backdrop of significant efforts that have been made in the legislature to clarify how California might reform its pretrial detention procedures. But then of course, we're a direct democracy jurisdiction. So there's this question of not only what does the legislature do, but what gets before the voters and how do the voters respond? So we, I, I think it's fair to say that at least some of us, probably all of us were also thinking, can we resolve the facts, uh, the issues that, that arise before us based on these facts, and still provide plenty of room for the legislature to come in later, maybe on the advice of a commission like this one, and say, okay, we can go further than a court can go. We can actually go deeper on questions of how to balance risk and rights, in effect, to try to come up with a process that will be respectful.
And here I get to uh, the last points that I'd like to make, which is what were we actually able to do in Humphrey and what issues really remain now for you all and for the people of California? Well, I would say what we could do in Humphrey is to clarify that provisions of the California Constitution that relate to pretrial detention allow trial court judges to be sensible and pragmatic, but to do so in a way that respects some basic rights at the end of the day, that without some fairly clear and specific findings, and we went into the precise wording in Humphrey, um, you ought not to be able to deny somebody their freedom uh, while a case is pending, but that it's certainly possible to do so, and that those decisions ought not to be made on the basis of whether somebody can pay. That was particularly problematic from the perspective of our legal traditions and commitments and all the factual findings and analyses that highlighted how that system actually worked in practice, okay? I don't think any of us had any illusion that simply by saying that, that every ambiguous question would get clarified at the level of the trial courts, but at least being clear that specific findings were needed and that simple inability to pay was not a really good, useful basis and not one that squared with California's constitution when it came to detaining people was critical. So what does that leave? Well, it leaves two crucial questions. On the one hand, the kinds of issues that the legislature was getting into before Humphrey that ultimately the voters decided they, they weren't quite ready for about how you might use concrete, reliable information about risk to make a very sophisticated and subtle calculus, how you might codify the full extent of protections that someone might get from arbitrary detention. Those are things the legislature can take up again. But I would say a further issue that remains is the implementation of the principles that were in Humphrey at the level of trial court stay in day out. I mean, again, I'll just close by emphasizing, I have some amazing colleagues on the court. All of us work very hard, but we were not in the position to write a detailed code that would resolve every question. And that meant there's a degree of interpretation that has to come to cases like Humphrey that will happen at the trial court level, but hopefully with enough clarity about what the big picture principles are. So it's all about advancing the conversation somewhat, maybe clarifying things a little bit beyond what the Court of Appeal could do, but at the same time recognizing that this is going to take years, maybe even a generation, to actually give the world a sense of what California is capable of in terms of what it means to be pragmatic, thoughtful, and careful on pretrial detention. Wow. Well, thank you so much. That really was super interesting to me and um, I think helpful to this committee. Um, before I jump in, does anybody have any immediate questions? Yeah, Assembly Member Brian and then Senator Skinner. So uh, several questions. Thank you for that presentation. Um, you know, I think pretrial has been a, a an interesting conversation to watch in California for the last several years, right? Uh, and then the comments you made about uh, the changes that went back to the voters that were rejected, it's still unclear to many why those were rejected. Right. Um, for some, it was the risk assessment and algorithmic part of the, the concrete data. Uh, for others, it was, you know, safety concerns or what have you. And Humphreys, one of the things that I've heard people still struggle with is what does ability to pay even mean? And is that interpretive case by case uh, in the courts? Should we be focusing on expanding things like concrete guidelines for site and release and other stages of, um, you know, pretrial interaction or involvement? And I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Thank you. I, I'm always a little loath to, uh, to overly interpret something my colleagues and I have signed on to, but I'll, I'll just tell you, I think that there's, to your point, there's plenty of room for some of those guidelines. I think those guidelines can be helpful. I think um, Humphrey stands for establishing a principle, okay? Like you, you can't simply do the status quo to the point where routinely all over California in urban regions and rural areas, people are just being denied bail because they simply couldn't come up with the money, didn't have a bond, so on. Uh, but, you know, is there room for somewhat different approaches to assessing ability to pay, to uh, figuring out um, exactly what facts might count there? I think there's some room. I think there's always been a degree of experimentation at the trial court level. I would encourage maybe a way to think about this that isn't just judge by judge, but court by court, right? Like I can imagine some room for some innovation in places like Los Angeles that have such a huge sprawling number of judges and a lot of internal um, division, even just at the LA level with respect to what judges do, 
but also a lot of these medium-sized courts that have uh, different caseloads uh, might get in on that discussion. But, you know, at least we ought to be very clear that whenever a jurisdiction begins to make judgments about people's pretrial release on the basis of their wealth or anything that gets close to it, it's really hard to put a constitutional happy face on that. Uh, and, and we ought to stop that. Thank you, Senator Skinner. Well, I um, I was curious about your reference to that it would be a generation before before it would be clear what California did, and that's confusing to me because I'm not sure whether you um, and maybe you aren't advocating a particular thing, but whether you are indicating that it would, which is what I heard, but maybe I'm that it would be helpful for the legislature to clarify some of the things in statute that the Humphrey decision was a uh, an expression of the court, but that it didn't, it wasn't writing of a statute. So if, if you're indicating that there would be uh, assistance if the legislature were to um, develop and adopt a statute, then what's your reference to the generation? So I guess it's two questions. Thank you for giving me the chance to clarify, Senator. I think that's a great question. I would say there were some aspects of Humphrey that to me are clear as day. At the end of the day, no person should lose the right to liberty simply because that person cannot afford to post bail. And in Humphrey, we found merit in that claim. And that meant there had to be some changes in the way California approached this question of who gets thin, who doesn't, where it isn't just like, well, you know, this is a pretty serious crime. Here's where I'll set bail. And I guess this person can't pay. So they'll just get locked up. Right. I think uh, my hope now speaking, not as a former justice, but more as a citizen of California, looking back on it, is that the jolt that comes from an opinion that says that very clearly, that we find merit in the claim that no person should lose the right to liberty simply because a person can't afford to press bail, will set in motion a set of changes that are now underway, where part of what happens is bail doesn't work the same way it used to. My reference to a generation, though, is, let's be honest, right, the underlying question goes back to the hard pretrial detention or a question, which is how do you weigh risk and rights? And I viewed California's legislative effort to get at that before Humphrey as a down payment on a continuing conversation about how you weigh data, how much local variation you allow, you know, how much discretion do judges have, so long as they're within the constitutional parameters we set in in, in cases like Humphrey. And that's what I mean that it'll take a general, like to me, there's a room for dialogue that is sort of the court says, you can't simply rely on the bail system we had. Okay, full stop. Now what? Okay, well, you can still detain people if they're risky. There are constitutional provisions that say that. If you make these particular findings, we talk about that in Humphrey. But now what? Like, you know, if it's okay to use certain algorithms, if so, you know, who's going to audit them? Uh, who's going to make sure that they're not off their rocker, as it were? And that to me, I think I would be too optimistic if I said that is going to take five years. We'll get that done in five years. I feel like that there needs to be some play in the joints, but also some clarity about what the standards are. Mike, no. if I can do, sorry, <laughs> Justin, Go ahead. I could just do one quick follow up. So yeah. we, and you could hold until the end of, but we, um, uh, part of our agenda today is adopting recommendations for our final report. And in that, we have um, some recommendations regarding the Humphrey decision and recommendations to the legislature around statute. And uh, since we are going to be discussing that and then adopting something today, uh, and you could wait till the end, but I would be curious whether you had reviewed it and whether you had any comments about those recommendations. Haven't had the chance to review, but I, I fully um, support and encourage a process that is sort of embodied in this particular group, which is the legislature has a special responsibility to and for all of us. That's why it's the legislature, but will benefit from a, an advisory structure that will allow more detail than what might normally be provided in the day-to-day -day committee structure. And I mean, you all know the legislature better than I do, but certainly I've spent a lot of time thinking about the legislature as a, an academic and as a government official and as a judge. And it feels to me like that special responsibility to be responsive, but to be honest and speak truth to power and to highlight the unresolved problems 
even if they're not going to lead to a legislative solution in 12 months, is really key. So I, I would encourage you to be ambitious with those recommendations, even if at the end of the day, it's going to take more than a legislative session to get everything enacted. Yeah. You know, I, I just wanted to, to say that the way I took uh, Justice Coyar's comment about a generation, it may take a generation, uh, hopefully not. But I think embedded in people's minds is, you know, the buzzword, no cash bail. People don't really understand that. Uh, and they think that the judges are just willy nilly letting people out solely on the basis that they can't come up with money. And I think that if the legislature has a role here to play, it would be to kind of uh, describe or isolate certain factors like risk, severity of the offense, uh, prior instances where the accused has fled has shown a risk of flight. Uh, I don't know if all that is, 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 is in one statute somewhere, but I think judges are accustomed to following guidelines, particularly say in sentencing, whether it's low term, midterm, high term. But I think coming out with a set of guidelines for uh, when to set bail and how high bail should be set so that we educate the public that it's not simply willy-nilly, no cash bail, everyone's going to be let out. But right now, when you you watch the news and you hear a politician speak about, you know, no cash bail, they think that everybody from misdemeanors to, to murderers are being let out without posting any kind of bail, which would ensure their uh, attendance uh, at, at trial or, or at a hearing. So I think I think it's 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 important that to the extent that there are, you know, gaps uh, in the kind of the outline that the court has given in, in Humphrey, I think the legislature has an important role to play and it can be done very quickly, maybe even quicker than one session as you suggest. But I think it's something that has to be addressed quickly just to eliminate this sort of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, of the description, you know, uh, whistling, whistleblowing. Uh, dog whistle of no cash bail. And that never has been the case. Justice Marino, I think that you're characteristically pithy and thoughtful on this. I agree. And I, let me let me just make two additional points. One is, um, it's probably worth remembering that at the end of the day, the struggle to get this right has been one that has been shared across branches of government, across different state governments, and so on. But you know, there is some clarity to some key parts of Humphrey that speak to your point about how this is all about striking the right balance. And I just want to highlight in particular some key points here, right? At the end of the day, what Humphrey is about is concluding that arrestee is not to be held in custody pending trial unless the court has made an individualized determination. That's key. Termination, not about a group of people, not about a class of offenses, but about this particular individual. And that determination is either that the arrestee has the ability to pay, but failed to pay nonetheless, like chooses not to pay or that detention is necessary to protect victim or public safety. That's your point, Justice Martin, about how this is all about balance, or to ensure that the defendant appears, and there's clear and convincing evidence that no less restrictive alternative will reasonably vindicate those interests. A judge has to be on the line to say, we're doing this because there's no less restrictive alternative. That's crucial, right? And again, to your point, pretrial detention on victim and public safety grounds subject to specific constitutional constraints, that is a key element of our criminal justice system. But conditioning that detention on arrestees' financial resources, that is not. That's not what California stands for. That's not what our constitution is about. That's how I take it, right? Now, you know, that that chapter in some sense is done because we spoke with that clarity. Another chapter has to begin. How do you implement this? How do you deal with these things about, you know, what's a less restrictive alternative and so on? There's some room for that in the courts, but also I think a key part of it ideally would be a legislative deliberation. I want to be respectful of your time, uh, Tino. Uh, let me just conclude with a, a couple of things. I, I was really impressed and appreciate your, your time. Um, first of all, we could talk about this for hours. I think you're right that this is um, a real conundrum for the justice system in general, and in some ways a microcosm of the criminal justice or criminal legal system in general, and how do we balance a public safety risk and individual rights. And it's something that we think and, and work a lot 
on all the time. So I really appreciate you sort of putting putting words to that. I also appreciate the time that you've taken to describe some of your own thoughts and, and deliberations and, and the interplay between the courts and the legislature. And that's something that, you know, it, with bail in particular, we are really um, struggling with, I think, not only as a committee, but as a state in general. So thank you for your continued guidance on that. Again, I wanna be respectful of your time. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. I hope to see you in person sometime when you're back in California. <laughs> Um, and thanks so much. And if you do have any continuing thoughts or, you know, um, advice for us, please don't be a stranger. The, the door is always open. Will do. And thank you, uh, Michael, for your role as chair and all of you for your service to California. I so appreciate that you clearly care about this issue and are working hard to make sure we get it right. Thank you. Have thank a good you. afternoon. Bye-bye. All right. Um, I think that that was quite helpful, actually, and um, I uh, suspect that we will be adding some of uh, Justice Cuellar's remarks to our eventual report, which I want to move to now as our second. Oh, excuse me. Before we move to the report, just an administrative matter. Um, we need to approve the minutes from the October mini from the October uh, meeting. Will someone? I move to uh, to adopt those minutes. Will someone second that? Any opposed? Oh, no. Second. All right, everybody's, everybody's in agreement. All right, the, the minutes uh, for the October meeting have been approved. Um, now let's just move to the discussion of the draft annual report. Um, so especially for Assemblymember Brian, we're going to follow our usual process. I know you haven't been with us for the past year, but we really appreciate um, your time with us today and, of course, your input. Um, we'll first discuss the report and any potential changes uh, amongst members of the committee and staff who really have outdone themselves yet again in, in drafting this incredible report. Um, we'll then hear public comment. And then finally, committee members will address any final concerns or issues and vote on whether to adopt the report with any noted changes. As you all know, the report is an elaboration of the recommendations we studied over the course of the past year and discussed, and I will note, approved in summary form in October. As always, our recommendations are supported by empirical reports, analysis from similar reforms in other states, and original resource research conducted with our help from our partners at the California Policy Lab. We are still finalizing data, and this draft and report will be put into final form by a graphic designer in the coming weeks. The goal today is to see if there, there are changes that the committee wants to make with the understanding that I will have final discretion over copy editing, adding citations, updating data, and other non-substantive changes before publication. So with that said, um, I thought it would be most helpful to um, walk down the, the recommendations uh, in order that they appear in the report and see if anybody has any thoughts or comments uh, on them. So we just have some order. Again, these we've all discussed these several times over the course of the year and uh, approve them again in summary form at our last meeting. So um, we begin with establishing a state-funded restitution system for crime victims. Does anybody have any thoughts, or comments, concerns about that recommendation? I have just a one, one question, Mike. Yeah. Uh, do we set kind of a cap on that, like four or $5,000? Is, is that in there? The top, Tom, you want to weigh in here? So yes, we do recommend a, a cap. And I think that we also recommend that for certain um, victims like municipalities, um, that they, they would not be included in the restitution fund. Tom, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I think that's right. I don't, you know, the, we looked at the data we could get on what the typical restitution order was. And I think it was around 1500 bucks or something. And, and 75% of them were around 4,000. So I think um, a cap is uh, almost not even necessary because the amounts are so low, but we can certainly clarify that we're not saying it should be unlimited, but should maybe be capped around, you know, five or $10,000, which is what the Vermont system that we're copying in some ways does. And, and do we account for, you know, corporations or other kind of entities that may have some risk insurance already built in? Yeah, I think that uh, was um, Mike's, uh, to Mike's point too, is that we're saying those, and it should go to people, not sort of those other non-people entities right. as a first step. 
And we appreciate, you know, especially Senator Skinner, I'm sure that you're having an eye on the budget that this is an expensive uh, line item. Uh, we This was the first uh, topic that we jumped into for the year. Um, and basically we went into it with a pretty open mind about what do crime victims want? And we heard over and over again that this was, you know, a real problem that uh, crime victims were not get, you know, they most of all wanted the money back for their car that was broken into. Yeah. Um, and that the restitution system as it currently works is completely abysmal, that nobody's getting um, paid at all. And then sometimes it's quite insulting in that CDCR is collecting, you know, um, a nickel here, a quarter there, a dollar there from folks who are incarcerated and sending a check for $2.35 to crime victims which is just you know almost adding insult to injury. And we thought that if we believe um, that a large factor of um, crime is societal, that society should cover and try as best as possible to make victims whole, not by incarcerating people necessarily, um, but by re uh, repaying them when at all possible. And we thought that the Vermont model was really quite sensible and, um, and I really like it. Although I appreciate that it is not um, without financing, financial right. issue. Right. Any other thoughts about this one? Yeah, Assembly Member Ryan. Clarifying question. I've been doing my reading, trying to catch up to speed. This is after a restitution order has been made following a conviction? Correct. Okay. And it's different from the victim's compensation, which is right. a different system altogether, which is confusing. And I would think a judge making that order would have the discretion as to uh, the 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 amount as well as whether it's you know, between medical expenses versus property losses and so forth. So there would be some discretion incorporated within the restitution order. We don't address that, but I would I would think that would be the case. I think we could make that more clear. That makes perfect sense, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> And right now, restitution orders are kind of are completely arbitrary. Nobody's paying them, so they're just like, like, it's, it's, it's meaningless. And they're provided in the Constitution. I mean, it's not an insignificant legal right. All right, um, so to, uh, Mike. The, the part of for me, the way the report was drafted, this section there wasn't enough clarity between what we are recommending and what our existing system is. And um, because we call our current system victim compensation. And so when we reference the victim compensation parent pioneered by Vermont, which we know is different and it does clarify in the report that it's a restitution, um, uh, but anyway, that there was for me a confusion reading it as to what our recommendation is that is different than the existing, um, California's existing program. Yeah, I think this area is very confusing in general, um, particularly the compensation restitution distinction. I think that we can do a better job on that. Tom, do you have thoughts on that? I think, uh, yeah, we can just put even more clarity on that. We, we That was something we were worried about and we tried to specify everything without getting too far into the weeds and having a treatise on the on the different systems, but we yeah. can definitely put a little more on that. The great, great feedback. And then the only other comment, I, you know, I suppose as a legislator, if I were to try and figure out how to, you know, set something up like this, it's uh, clearly there will never be a state fund adequate to compensate people for whatever their losses. Now we're talking different than their medical expenses, say, or you know, uh, mental health care, trauma care. If it would, you know, depending on the type of crime that was committed against them, those are the kind of things that our current program is trying to cover, which it inadequately does because there's not even enough money in that. But in this case, we're talking about trying to assist you in what your, I suppose, your monetary loss was. So given that there's no way we could ever cover everybody's monetary loss, is it, you know, the reference that was just made was, you know, is there a cap on it or is, is it uh, a proportional thing? Is it based on the person's income or is it purely a, you know, just a gesture type of thing where there's a flat out amount that might be that 
you know, the, the legislature would establish a fund and then there's just a, a dollar amount, like 5K, I guess is what was it, 5K that is given to anybody and everybody, regardless of what their loss was or what their income is or, you know, et cetera. But it's just like an ex, uh, expression of, um, uh, you know, you were a victim of crime. Yeah. But otherwise, it's like, I don't know how we would do it. How would you structure it? But so so let, let me answer it this way. Like so many things in the criminal justice system, I think the extreme cases distort the system in an unfair way. Um, the As Tom mentioned, the average restitution order, which is supposed to account, now they judges know that these are generally not going to get paid, but it's supposed to account for what is your monetary loss is $1,500. It's not an extraordinary amount because the vast majority of crimes are people's bikes getting stolen and cars getting broken into and iPhones getting stolen. They are not rape, murder, and child molestation, which sort of dominates our or conception of crime. So for the vast majority of people, I think that they can be compensated for their financial loss um, relative with a relatively small amount of money. In order to keep costs from going out of control, I think it is in Vermont, um, they have a $5,000 cap just to make it so it's not you know, extraordinary. They've also limited the financial liability to the state because a large percentage of the victims are municipalities and large businesses, shoplifting, vandalism against schools, things things of that. Again, to keep the, the cost down and to make sure that victims, individual victims are compensated. Um, we have not included an idea of means testing. So if you steal from a rich person that the state wouldn't pay you back for that. Um, and I think it's, we saw it, um, I see it at least as um, a sense of the state taking responsibility for uh, making you whole and, uh, and avoiding this, I think, charade actually, that um, the, the, peop the, the defendants, the people who committed the crimes um, are able to pay you back. Now, we're not saying that those people are off the hook financially. The state can continue to go and try to collect that money from the people who committed the crimes or convicted of the crimes, that's perfectly fine. I don't think that there's, we're going to be very successful in most cases, but um, certainly in some cases, and people should um, pay their victims back. But I, I mean, pay back the cost of the harm that they caused. Um, but I think that we have a very complicated and ineffective system as it is. I actually think that this would simplify things considerably if a court said here's the money that the state fund should pay the victim period you know this is what you lost your bike done and we have a we have a restitution fund already to do that it's just funded completely and ineffectively because we're trying to um get money from people who who, who don't have any money at all so does the does this then waive the burden on people who are incarcerated or does the state get reimbursed from the pennies on hour that they are are paid that would normally go to the victims in you know small increments at a time the way that we believe that we left the recommendation and uh i think that the, the, the state could continue if it wanted to to try to collect money from the people who committed the crimes it would go into the fund but it, but the but the from the victim's perspective they wouldn't their repayment wouldn't depend on whether or not the person who committed the crime could pay or not. The judge says you lost the bicycle. It was five hundred dollars. You get a check for five hundred dollars. Subsequently, the state uh, could try to collect that five hundred dollars from the person who was incarcerated. That's the, the, keeping the current system. That's the way it works in Vermont. It seems fair to me, although ineffective. Um, and. That's the way that the recommendation currently stands. Do we do we have any concerns about the state having, you know, I think the size of California relative to Vermont, if the state were to go to the to that model and have kind of this outstanding liability um, due back to it from people who are incarcerated, the state then has a, a vested interest in that incarcerated labor. I'm just curious if, if there's any, if we see any potential problems with the state relying on what could you know, be millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. I don't know what the sum would come out to, but on, on the labor of incarcerated people that the state incarcerates. 
I think that that's certainly a concern. We, we, we have it already, right? The court- We orders. already, yeah. It's already mm-hmm. existing. I mean, it's not the state being refunded, so it's not a, you know, the, it's the financial interest of the of the victim and the courts enforcing their order, which I almost think is is worse. I would rather um, the state be the uh, the lender, as it were, the person than crime victims. I don't know, Tom, do you have a thought about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think these are all, these are all things that we certainly thought about. Um, th- I think the key thing here is right now, because as you mentioned, Mike, the right to restitution for the victim, it's in the constitution that the person has the right to get it directly from the person who's convicted, that the state right now has no ability to say, we're going to try to be realistic and not get, you know, three cents every other month from you. And what this system would do would say, okay, we're going to separate these two things. We're going to, we're going to pay the victim immediately in full to what a court has determined is appropriate under sort of the existing restitution structure. Um, And then and that's as far as this recommendation in our report would go. It's sort of it's a very victim centric from the victim's point of view. What do they want to be satisfied? But it, it very easily. But then you sever this uh, or you create the ability for the state, as we've done in many other circumstances with the legislature's guidance to say, let's not impose fines and fees on people who can't ever pay them. It's counterproductive. It actually hurts rehabilitation. It would set the stage for that to happen in a way that the current system, because it's this constitutional right that the victim has, um, the state doesn't have the ability to, to rethink its collection practices. So I think that is a very natural next step in this area. Just this for this recommendation, I think we're trying to just be totally victim centric. And if I, you know, maybe I'm unique, but if I should, I wouldn't want to have to worry about what the collection is in the system is going to be later on immediately. But I think um, this recommendation, if it were to become law, would set up the ability for the legislature and the and the state to take that next step in a way that isn't possible really right now. All right. So it seems to me, I've heard two um, suggestions that I think that we can uh, handle without problem, which is to clarify the existing law and particularly the difference between restitution and compensation that Senator Skinner mentioned, and also make explicit um, the courts have discretion on to set the appropriate uh, value of the restitution order. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think, so I, I just quickly glanced at the language in the report again. I read it last night, but I was just looking. So Mike, you used the term, make the victim whole. I think obviously that is not what's going to be done here. And that is not, so we shouldn't even reference mm-hmm. that. And I don't think we do, but I think what we're, if I understand it correctly from the from the testimony we heard and the nature of our discussion now is it's, it is, I don't know what, I'm struggling with the word, but it's a, it's, it's not the state, the state can't take responsibility for that fact that you were a victim of crime. I think that's an unfair notion because that, but the state is extending that as a victim of crime, that um, for, in the interest of public safety, your your um, ah, you're being respected or you're being, uh, I don't know what word to use. I don't want to use the make whole, but some concept that you're, that you are, uh, there's a, a remedy, it's being recognized that as a victim of crime, you were harmed and thus there is a monetary payment to you to help with that harm. And that if it's that kind of concept, then it'll be, to me anyway, it's easier to structure it because then you're not so much structured on trying to determine exactly what the loss was for any one person and how, you know, that then you have to make that compensation based on that loss. Anyway, so that's what I was trying to think that we could articulate more in in the draft. I think that that makes sense, and um, I don't mean to suggest that we can make you know somebody entirely whole. At the same time, I do think that we should recognize and realize that the vast majority of crimes and convictions are low-level property crimes. You know, and again, we may capture the uh, our minds may run immediately to very severe violent crimes, which are often impossible to um, compensate for in any sense of the way. But in these small level, low level crimes, I mean, I think it's it's what it's what victims have told us that they, they want. They want their bike replaced. 
They want their car window fixed. Um, all right, with those um, comments and suggestions, is are we okay to move? I'm going to move on to the next. Uh, well, only other thing I'd add is there's less in this part of the report about why this particular action would benefit public safety. Yes, this this is not an explicit public safety uh, benefit. Um, I mean, I think that it would be kind of. Um, well, if there is data that shows that this kind of program has a corollary benefit to public safety, that would be great to cite. We'll look at that. Tom, you got that? Yes. We'll see if there's anything from Vermont. I'd Vermont like is really the state, the state that does this, but we can look at yeah. restitution in general and see how it's, if, if there's any public safety related studies related to that. I think we can do that. Yeah. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, the next idea is, uh, the next recommendation is to create a victim's right to restorative justice. This was brought to us primarily by a Yolo County District Attorney, um, who was, at the, I was he at the time the, the, the president of the CDAA. Yes. Um, and the, the basic idea here is that um, courts, uh, county courts would uh, approve restorative justice programs in their jurisdiction. And if they had that, then um, victim crime victims would uh, would be notified. The courts would be required to notify victims that that's an opportunity. And if the victim wanted the uh, restorative justice program, uh, then then that would trump any other decision by the prosecutor. In other words, that it would become a restorative justice um, process rather than a traditional criminal prosecution. Um, we struggled over the years, actually, from our very first meeting, I think, on how to legislate some sort of restorative justice program. This seemed to be the most sensible. And it was particularly interesting from my perspective, I think, to focus, consider this as a victim's right and uh, particularly powerful that it was suggested by the head of the District Attorneys Association. So um, that's why those are some of my thoughts on it. I think it's great. All right. Any other thoughts? Great. Um, this uh, the next uh, recommendation is uh, expand victim right to civil compromise. This is kind of in the same vein as uh, restorative justice and uh, in some ways the restitution, which is right now under California law um, in some and mostly is it all misdemeanor cases, Tom? There are some exclusions, but yeah, non nonviolent. I think. Yeah. yeah. That um, that um, victims can feel uh, if they feel that they've been um, satisfied that they can that basically they can drop charges, and this would expand that to additional offenses and expand it to m more than just monetary satisfaction. So, if um, the person who committed the crime, for example. Uh, volunteered to do some community service or whatnot, the victim, again, this would be more of a victim right to say that, um, to drop criminal prosecution in lieu of the satisfaction. I had some, some Please. points about this. Okay, in reading it last night, um, to me, it, it wasn't explained very clearly. And there weren't, in other parts of the report, we make reference to testimony we received as um, <clears throat> in terms of the, you know, why this, why this recommendation stands out to us. Uh, and that seemed um, not there in this part of the report. And also um, the reference to nonviolent felonies, uh, you know, obviously there's a ton of those. Um, and I think the, again, some illustration of the type of crime that might be, uh, be eligible for this might be helpful because um, again, the, this basket of <laughs> felonies is a huge basket. And what, you know, what are we, um, what would we envision that would be the, you know, some, some, mention of example of the type of crime that might benefit from this. I think the most helpful example might be felony vandalism. This is Espinosa speaking. 
Um, it's, it's easily resolved between the parties um, and shouldn't be controversial, but I mean, that would be the first crime I think of. Tom, do you have a thought about what Senator Skinner said? Well, I, I think um, the, it, well, on specific offenses, yeah, I think, you know, felony vandalism is a good one. I think there are other sort of offenses involving property damage that are natural, but if you want to move away from just paying money, you know, you can imagine, uh, I, I think the idea is you want to give a crime victim flexibility, not just say it's either going to be essentially incarceration or, 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 or nothing. So even like a, you know, uh, low level um, or higher level theft cases and things like that. So we, we can certainly um, work in some references to more common offenses. And when we look at how it's, you know, one that it's, it's actually used up for a lot is a uh, welfare fraud right now too, where there's some, you know, negotiation instead of doing criminal prosecution there um, to resolve it some other way. So uh, the idea is that it, it should be pretty wide, but we, we can um, get some more specificity to that. And I think the way it works with um, the testimony we heard is restorative justice is really, I think the practice and the research has shown it really works well for violent offenses where you have a much more involved, pro you know, it's, it's a very involved process to go to a restorative justice meeting. And that, you know, if sort of you, you know, are dealing with a, your window being broken in your car, you may say, well, I don't quite want to go through that whole, um, you know, uh, process for this, but maybe in the, it's civil compromise is a way to have sort of similar values to have like, you know, let's not just go for um, uh, incarceration or sort of one of these, you know, more common outcomes and the victims are more in the driver's seat of what, what they want to do. So it sort of pairs, the, the way we think of it is sort of pairs with restorative justice, which should probably be for more serious cases. And that's the research we heard about in, in San Francisco in particular that showed a huge reduction in recidivism after a, a successful restorative justice practice there. And that civil compromise, it already exists. It works well for some offenses. Why not you know, expand the aperture on that and try to uh, reach some of the same values that we're we're going for the restorative justice one. Maybe we can make this uh, make that point more explicit in the mm -hmm. report, and that this is kind of a restorative justice. We're trying to expand it, you know, beyond its its typical uh, domain. And I think that the point that you made is quite is makes a lot of sense in the much more serious violent cases where you may not want to go through that whole thing. But at the same time, I think that, again, we're trying to send it. This is all comes out of our conversations about trying to address victims' concerns. And I do yeah. think examples, I, I, I would try to, you know, we do have some data on what's currently used in civil compromise. And Tom alludes to this welfare fraud issue. I mean, it, it really jumped off the, the screen to all of us. Um, but I think that we can come up with, um, I would try to use some sort of common and common sense of examples if we can. Yeah, no problem. That seems to make sense. Um, all right, moving on to the next um, recommendation. This is uh, to prohibit uh, traffic stops by police for technical traffic infractions. These would be, we would, the recommendation is that uh, police may not be able to, are not able to pull somebody over uh, merely for a technical violation. They will still be able to pull people over um, for speeding, running red lights, anything that would be safety related, but we're talking about things like expired registrations or uh, tinted windows or, or uh, issues like that. And this, this follows really on um, the Ripper Board recommendation and just the, not only the, blatantly racist um, application of uh, many of these traffic stops, but also just their very limited value uh, for public safety purposes. I think I think it's great. Um, and it says at a minimum of offenses related to, and then it lists five, I guess, each of those categories has a, has a wider range of subcategories. Is that something we're going to enumerate on or we, or we trust legislators to figure out on their own? Uh, so we, we started with the ones that are most common now in the RIPA data um, and, and tried to tie it to specific vehicle codes. Um, but I think it's, uh, it can always be expanded because, you know, 
we, we tried to group together like things related to registration. I think that's actually like four or five different vehicle codes. So um, I think there's definitely room for the legislature to add to that list. But we, but we tried to start with what already are the most um, frequent ones in the in the data. And I think that's why the that wording you, you, you mentioned in some of member, Brian, at a minimum is so important is like, you know, it's it's a bit of a moving target, um, pun intended, I guess, uh, where uh, we can't, you know, it should be more offenses probably than, than fewer because, you know, one of the points we make is a vehicle code. Every time one of us drives, we probably are immediately violating some aspect of it. So it's it's so expansive and gives so much discretion. And the point is to be as clear, which I think, you know, I'm sure law enforcement won't necessarily embrace this, but to the, as clear as it can be, um, better implementation if that makes my, sense. my other question is i know that you know in, in los angeles we've been pushing for things like this for a long time specifically with the lapd metro division and some of the history of of their stops but uh, the department of transportation is looking into potentially filling what may be perceived as like a, a vacuum in this role mm -hmm. um and i'm wondering if there are any you know conversations that have been been had or any thoughts to the idea is this a vacuum that's being created or just by taking this tool um that leads to pretextual stops out of the the hands of um you know law enforcement does it have to be in the hands of anybody else or is that enough you know we i think we're really we're focused on the traffic stops for it so it's not as if you can't get a, a ticket for these offenses it just shouldn't be the, the basis for these traffic <laughs> stops which we just years of data have shown and per, everyone's personal experience shows are just these particularly fraught um, experiences in many ways. So I think that's the focus of the recommendation is let's not be the basis for a stop, but if certainly other means to en enforce the law seem appropriate, just we've seen so much information that this doing it this way is doesn't help public safety, takes a lot of time and leads to these just, you know, bad outcomes in many, many other ways. Yeah, I, I would com completely support um, people getting, you know, tickets, just like if you blow through a, um, a, um, a toll turnstile or, you know, even red light cameras, you know, they're enforced, you know, all the time. And if you have an expired registration, you should pay, you know, the expired registration. Um, but, but the stops are really the problem that we're trying to address, at least. Yeah, one one comment. I sent uh, Tom an article from the LA Times on the uh, pilot project that LAPD had, and I think it's uh, Officer Rhodes who made a presentation. So maybe a footnote to that uh, LA Times article on how the how the pilot project is proceeding, which I thought was was favorable. Yeah, so, absolutely. We're we're actually hoping to get. Um... <laughs> that same data and a more and a more recent version of it so i think we're, we're planning on presenting that um yeah. in the report that there's less stops overall but that's sort of been happening for a while but it's really the the, the proportion of moving versus non-moving has changed where there's more stops or moving violations which is the safety related ones is a, is a way to think about it so it does seem like there have been some um positive developments there yeah all right with that note, I'm going to move on to the next one, which is related, which is to limit consent searches during traffic stops. Um, so the recommendation here is to uh, allow police officers to request permission during traffic stops only when the officer has reasonable su suspicion that the search will uncover evidence of a crime. In other words, it can't just be a fishing expedition. And we thought that reasonable su suspicion was a pretty low um, um, bear, uh, bar to, to pass. And it should be, you know, you shouldn't just, we shouldn't be doing dragnet searches. Um, and you should be able to say why you think somebody uh, has committed a more serious crime. And um, that seems perfectly reasonable to me. All right. Um, unless there's any comments, I can move on to the next one which is to ensure the Public Defense Council is appointed before arraignment. Um, this is moving into the, the, our later end of our committee uh, studies and, and recommendations, which is that right now arraignment happens um, basically 24, uh, 48 hours following arrest, excluding Sundays and holidays. And that's really the first time that um, public defenders meet with their clients. 
we saw a lot of data that earlier representation in the system as early as possible um, not only um, results in better outcomes um, for the defendants, but also better public safety outcomes. I think that that was kind of the surprising uh, result. Uh, more people appear for their bail hearings, fewer people reoffend, um, and that was something that was very promising. And here, I, I, I assume that there will be some uh, concern about uh, finances. We're only we're saying the same system should exist. We're just trying to say that people that the public defender should be appointed and noti notified and appointed as early on in the system as possible, mm -hmm. earlier than than arraignment, so that they have some representation at a, at those arraignment proceedings. You know, so, the one one question I always have on these recommendations, and I'm sure Nancy does too, is there's the cost element that you just referred to, because there are a lot of moving parts. <laughs> in any kind of arraignment, a lot of the different justice agencies are involved. And the one thing that struck me in this recommendation was the suggestion that in terms of, you know, uh, addressing that issue of cost, that it could all be done, say like on a Sunday, uh, uh, the weekends, because we're advocating that, you know, some kind of determination uh, be set uh, on, on a weekend. Uh, and the comment was made, well, they could all be done in one building, one courthouse. But in a in a county as vast as Los Angeles, right. you know, to move people uh, even from, from a couple of jails to a say a central courthouse, that's a lot of transportation involved and uh, you know, expense to the DA, to the county, to the courts, et cetera. So you know, in a lot of these recommendations, I think, what is this really going to cost to, to implement? And I think it sounds great. Uh, I think we had the presentation, but from Santa Clara County, that sounded really good. But I always think about taking these things to scale uh, that, you know, who's going to absorb the costs and definitely would have to consult, you know, the public defender, how that's going to affect its budget, you know, whether or not we can just do this like video arrangements. Uh, you know, right now we do the problem cause determinations by telephone, but maybe to address the transportation issue it could be done by video. But anyway, it it's, doesn't have to be in the in our recommendation. But those are things that I always think of in the back of my mind. That sounds great. Uh, will the counties approve it? Will the different departments approve it? Is the state going to fund it, et cetera? And I don't think the state funds public defenders. We we did a little just recently, but in general we don't. Yeah. Um, well, um, Tom, I'm curious what you think about this. I mean, you know, we of course we are you know keep our eye on the budget, but we're trying to make recommendations that are best you know best for the the state and and public safety. Um, and I know also we can't. Um, uh, calculate in the cost savings right. in the anticipated public safety benefit right. of this, which I think the data does prove that it actually reduces incarceration, which is the cost of cost, cost savings because people aren't incarcerated, and reduces future crime, which is also cost savings. So we are not able to real or realize or account for any of that. Um, and ultimately, what we're recommending is the same exact representation. It's just moved up, moved up right in time. Um, I realize that there might be some logistical difficulties about that, but Santa Clara is not a small county. I mean, I realize it's not Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, Tom, do you have additional thoughts about with regard to our recommendation? You know, there are logistical issues. Lots of other states do this, and I think we need to just have faith that we're California. Did Justice Cuellar said, and uh, we can do it, is, is yeah. my short answer. Um, it will cost money, and, you know, if it costs more money to transport people, but then there's less people in jail longer, I don't know, you know, it's it's different fiefdoms and you say one department money they don't care if other you know it's it's very complicated in, in in these ways but i think um you know if there's greater public safety less pretrial incarceration and you know court hearings probably go faster you know if the lawyer is there ready you might be able to resolve cases sooner so i, I think it's hard to calculate for all of that um but you know i think if if new york can do this california can too <laughs> right I, I think it's a great idea and maybe you know the future is in Zoom, and you can have these arraignments with counsel present, and put 
counsel and the arrestee in a room and they talk and then you move on to, to the actual arraignment and release or whatever happens. Yeah, that's, you know, I'm a very mixed feelings about that. Having done some of those, it was, you know, well before our current technology. But, you know, one of the things we heard about uh, from Professor Heaton, who, who presented the big study from Philadelphia, is this doesn't have to be lawyers only, that having social workers and, and other folks do some of the information gathering and then the lawyers might be the people who make the arguments in courts. I think there's a lot of space for flexibility and, and creativity um, in that if we sort of urge it, um, hopefully it, it will it will happen. We even heard from the one of the uh, district attorneys in Santa Clara too that they support it because you know yeah. the more people are prepared, I think um, it makes court uh, go better a lot of the time. Yeah, no, believe me, <laughs> you know, serving on the Mr. Court and Superior Court, public defenders would use the arraignment day time to meet their client, mm. and rather than starting at eight thirty, you'd start at nine thirty just waiting for them to connect. But if that could be done in advance, perfect. It does, it does expedite things. And I think uh, there's better decision-making that's made with that advance consultation. Hmm. So in the ideal, ideal world. Yeah, and, and I would also reiterate that what Tom was alluding to, that California is among the worst states on this score um, in terms of when counsel is appointed. And, you know, every metric in terms of, you know, it's win-win-win across the board, including, I think, surprisingly, the, re the improvement to public safety. So um, I think this, this makes um, a ton of sense. And maybe we can make a little bit more explicit in the, rec in the recommendation about the flexibility, about the logistics that we, that we expect different counties to be able to, um, you know, meet their requirements in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one suggestion, and that is um, we reference these different states that are, are doing this. It might be worth it just take one of them and give a little more detail about how they've done it. Um, and maybe if and if that state has has either detailed or anecdotal uh, description of the benefits they've experienced due to it. Senator Skinner and Assemblymember Brian, uh, one thing that we spend a lot of time on is looking at models from other states. We assume that that's helpful to the legislature. With that in mind, uh, we also try to keep, you know, peer states in mind, large states when we can. Um, are there states that are, I mean, are conservatives, you know, red states more influential or what would, what's most helpful? Well, the references like New York and Illinois, those are two states that you know, aren't viewed as being, I mean, sure, they're blue states, but they're not viewed as progressive as California per se. Um, so they're they're useful. Uh, you know, if there's a red state in there, you can use an example. You mentioned Florida, it's fine. Uh, but I think that the the larger the state in a funny way is the is most useful. But um, that makes sense. Yeah. Anytime you can throw Texas. Yeah. Yeah. No. Anytime you have okay. Texas in the case study, we're 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 moving. Um, but Texas think, well, or Florida. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, look, we use everything. I've used Kansas, Kentucky, you name it. On I mean, felony murder. That was easy. We were one of the real outliers. Um, this one. This seems. Uh, our reference is that there's 27, but it says jurisdictions. Some of those may not be states. They might be counties or big cities or something. But you know, taking one or two of the states you reference and just giving a little more information about, you know, exactly what they're doing would be helpful. I think we say jurisdiction because we include like, it's mostly states, but it's like Washington, D.C. and I think maybe uh -huh. Guam or something like that, but it's, it's mostly yeah. states. <laughs> okay. All right. So with those notes, especially about the flexibility and uh, singling out a, a state or two, um, for the public defender um, recommendation. All right, moving on to the next one. Uh, modernize the system as competency to stand trial. This is one of the more eye-opening, I think, uh, hearings that we had about just how broken uh, the competency system is. Um, and so, the and how um, in some ways lawless and not really a lot of advice or direction from the legislature. So uh, this is one of our more involved recommendations. Uh, which has three parts, require judges to determine whether restoration competency is in the interest of justice, 
right? Sometimes we're, they're just required to, in many cases, uh, just required to order uh, restoration even when it seems not to be in the interest of justice. Uh, number two is more procedural, which is require court appointed mental experts to return evaluations within 30 days of a court order. We heard a lot of problems about the timeline about how competency um, determinations are made. And then third, require a judge to determine uh, with the advice of uh, mental health experts, whether a person found incompetent to stand trial has a probability of attaining competency within the required time frame. So if somebody's not going to be uh, restored, then they should uh, be uh, directed towards uh, treatment and, rather than just um, a service that would try in vain to um, restore them to competency. Tom, is there anything else that I should add to that? I think that was great. All right. Any thoughts? Um, I will note, even though Senator Skinner has st stepped away, that um, the um, Department of uh, State Hospitals has had you know considerable financial problems related to the competency system. And uh, this is in some ways helpful, I think should be helpful to try to address some of those issues. Um, although again, that's not the focus of our recommendation. Um, next, this builds on, uh, I believe what we heard from Judge um, Leif Leifman in, uh, from Miami-Dade County, which was to encourage data sharing um, between various uh, institutions to address frequent utilizers in the criminal legal system. Um, Tom, do you want to address this? I think you know th this this recommendation is a little unlike ones we've done in the past, which are not sort of talking about a specific you know chunk of the penal code or something like that. But this recognition that um, places that have been able to link this data together, come up with ways to use it well, have had tremendous results. I mean, I think the one I've I've cited a few times is you know San Diego did something like this and had you know something like 70% reductions in arrest, uh, hospital bed usage. So it's just um, a, a very, seemingly a very effective way to um, address the folks that everyone realizes are, are going to come through different systems a lot. But it's it's not sort of saying, you know, penal code section 809 should do X, X Y, and Z. So that's the only frame I'd, I'd put on it. All right, unless there are any thoughts or suggestions or comments, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Are we, yeah. Um, the next recommendation is to update pretrial procedures. And this really includes two recommendations. The first, and, uh, and I think more significant is to ensure that arrested people have their first appearance in court no more than 48 hours uh, upon arrest. Right now, the current rule in California is 48 hours, unless that happens to fall on a Sunday or holiday. We would um, exclude those exceptions. In other words, you have to be here um, before a judge within 48 hours of being locked up, period, full stop. Again, this is an area where other big states um, have uh, done this. I think in New Jersey, it's 24 hours. Is that right, Tom? It's 48 hours, but the reality is that 90% of cases are heard within 24 hours. The the judges have decided that's what they wanted to do. But the, on the books, it's 48. But and, reality is much quicker. And in California, in some cases, it can be, you know, I think up to five days. We've heard, you know, worse horror stories. Um, well, imagine last week with Thanksgiving, you know, you, you'd get Thursday, Friday, and then Sunday. So it, it, you know, it can add up pretty routinely. Um, and the next is, uh, to, this is uh, a statutory interpretation of a United States Supreme Court decision, which is to codify the requirement of uh, probable cause determination and require courts uh, to make a record of that determination. All right, unless there are comments. Good. Yes, Senator Skinner. Um, uh, I think the, the, the recommendation around the doing it within 24 hours is clearly 
it is the right recommendation. The practicality is a different question. It's not just cost. I think that just the practicality of, um, you know, do we have, for example, uh, a comparable number of judges per capita as, say, New Jersey does? Do we have, I mean, it, it's one of those where there may be um, logistical things that make it very difficult to do. Uh, and of course, the distances in places like LA County are obvious, but um, I mean, those, I suppose I'm only raising these because I always like it when our recommendations are something that we think are at, could actually get um, implemented. And this one, well, anyway, that, yeah, I mean, Th this one undoubtedly. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, it yeah. feels like the way we currently do it, it, this way you'd either front load it before a holiday and get people within 48 hours, get them done before, or you're doing it on the back end and you're loading up cases for when you return. And so you you have this volume influction after the holiday or before the holiday if you still want to take the holiday off. Is that? Am I feeling that wrong? No, that's correct. Under the current system, right? That's the that's the way it happens. And we're not asking anybody to make more determinations. It's the same amount of judges and the same amount of judging. It's the same amount of cases. You just have to do it within this time period. Now, um, you you could imagine, you know, systems where there's still no work on Sundays or um, on holidays because they would have their arraignment, you know, immediately. Um, I guess if you were arrested on a Sunday and it was a long holiday weekend. Um, there might have to be some exceptions to that. But again, this California is one of the worst um, in the state, on, in the country uh, on this. And um, I think it goes along with, you know, um, I guess what Justice Cuellar was saying about balancing rights and um, and safety. And it's, I think, something that we, we can and should do. Uh, Judge Espinoza. I have a question um, about the second recommendation requiring prompt judicial review. And I think I talked about this in, in our meeting in Los Angeles County. For over a decade, we've had a system where judges are required to serve on the weekends, reviewing probable cause statements from law enforcement to make a determination as to whether or not there's probable cause to detain some person until Monday um, for their arraignment. Does this recommendation account for that? I, I think it, um, I think so. It, let me ask more, more specific. Does that procedure satisfy this requirement is a better way to ask my question. I, I think it would. I think the idea with this is a lot of courts are probably doing this. It's just that it's not in the penal code. And so there may be, and what we heard from a, a survey of practitioners that there's inconsistencies, county to county, maybe even courthouse to courthouse. And so Hopefully this wouldn't be a big shock to the system. This is something that is, you know, supposed to have been done for 30 plus years by the U.S. Supreme Court. So this would just sort of be one of our more technical recommendations, just to make sure everybody, okay, just we're all on the same page. We have to do this. This is the time frame. It's penal code section. Blah blah blah. Instead of it just being floating in the ether out there and every and even a lot. We even looked at um, local rules of court, and nobody addressed this. It's just totally unaddressed, you know, in any source of law except in the Supreme Court case, which came from California, ironically enough. Um, so, so it's a very technical fix that hopefully would just like, oh, okay, yeah, this is how a system, we should have all our rules written down <laughs> somewhere um, and not uh, inspire big change in practice, except for places that aren't complying with it and they've had 30 years to get with the program. So yeah. now is the time to do it, I think. Yeah, I, I have the same thoughts that Peter had. Uh, and it goes back more than 10 years. I mean, back when I was in, on the municipal court, in 1986, 87, whenever McLaughlin came out, we implemented and we were on, we were on call on weekends. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty, and you would talk to different, you know, law enforcement agencies. I mean, here, you know, LAPD, Compton PD, the Sheriff's Department, Highway Patrol, you'd get calls from those departments as to people they had in custody. And you'd get a summary of what the the arrest was about the crime that had been committed uh, or charged, potentially, and you'd give yay or nay to that. So it didn't. It's fair. It was fairly routine, and uh, so if this just means 
codifying McLaughlin or with the rules or legislation, I, I don't think it's a big deal, at least in LA County. Hmm. That is the idea, absolutely. That is, yeah, certainly the intent. Yeah. And I think this goes to the some of the core um, directive from the legislature, what the committee is supposed to stand for in terms of clarifying the, the penal code and making sure there's consistency throughout the state. All right. Uh, moving on to the last uh, recommendation, which is which is a significant one, a large one, um, and Wait, goes back. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes, Senator Skinner. Apologies. Um, on the, I'm jumping back before the pretrial one to the data one. Mm -hmm. The data one that I thought the um, the draft is written really well, gives really good examples of why it's so useful. But I also noted that, for example, the um, I think it was Miami, the, the very individual who described to us what how beneficial it was also said that they dropped their program because they didn't have sustainable funding um, uh, which is ironic obviously because um, it clearly saved them a lot of money but uh, city of San Diego that's the other one that was described but got discontinued because of lacking sustainable funding um, I guess my point is, is that in reading it, you know, we make a compelling argument for this, but we, by making the recommendation, encourage data sharing, those to me are recommendations, you know, what does that mean? What is that in terms of practicality? Uh, and what, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether whether something more like maybe a uh, state should fund a pilot program to demonstrate the uh, savings that would result with this type of uh, data sharing, or I don't know, something more, more concrete that might result in an actual take up of the recommendation. I tend to agree, Tom, what do you think? Absolutely, I think we were just being sensitive to the, um budget issues and perhaps we went too far in the other direction um but i think that's a a, a, a better much better way to to frame it yeah maybe there's one or two examples of a concrete way that that recommendation could potentially be implemented because i always feel like recommendations that are um have no clarity on how to achieve thing like that that they just they don't go anywhere even if we are clear, they don't always go somewhere. So, <laughs> so I think that's true. Um, oh, that's true too. Uh, no, I, that, and that's a very easy frame to, to put on in it. We may have even drafted it like that at one point. So, so I think we can um, to suggest that for sure. Great. All right, moving to the last recommendation, which is um, regarding um, the Humphrey decision and uh, Justice Cuellar's, I think actually quite helpful comments um, this morning. Um, I see these as four, four parts. So let me just go through them quickly um, and really reflects the almost day long of testimony that we heard from everybody in the system, public defenders, prosecutors. And then the, if you guys remember the panel of judges who all unanimously agreed that Humphrey is really not being either implemented at all or it, it certainly inconsistent, inconsistently throughout the state. We tried to isolate the elements that would be uh, most useful. Um, and in, in many ways, uh, we're doing nothing more than interpreting Humphreys, um, not expanding it uh, at, at all, just making sure that it's consistently applied throughout the state. Um, so the four uh, ideas that I, at least I see them is making explicit as a presumption for release that you're innocent until proven guilty. Um, when conditions of release should be imposed. And we talked uh, in some regard about ankle monitoring and other um, ways that conditions can be imposed. Um, and uh, how courts should determine affordable cash bail amounts. Right now, there is no uh, direction. And I think Justice Cuellar alluded to this idea that um, there um, different counties are, are doing it differently, different judges are doing it differently, some judges are not doing it at all in order to figure out a way um, to what is uh, reasonably affordable, which is required by the Humphrey decision. 
Um, and then the fourth uh, piece, which is not really part of Humphrey, but is a solution that we've seen in other states that seems to make a, a bunch of sense, uh, is to allow courts to accept refundable percentage of cash bail amounts. In other words, that you don't need to rely on a commercial um, bail bonds person, but that the courts could do this themselves. Um, and it doesn't need to be the full uh, amount of the, the 10%. Um, Tom, is there anything elaboration that you'd like to make on any of this? No, I, that was a great summary. The, 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 well, the one thing I would add is on the ability to pay, we, we do get pretty, the, the draft gets pretty precise about how court should do that, which obviously Humphrey didn't do. And I don't know if there's any interest in going further into that, but I wanted to note that. And that's based on talking to other places that have actually tried to implement a real ability to pay determination in this in the bail context, which is different than fines and fees and things like that. And I think the bottom line is that we said um, no more than 50% of a person's monthly disposable income. Yes. I think as a, as a practice, I'm a fan of any recommendation that cites my work at UCLA in the footnotes. <laughs> so well, well done, guys. It's a, it's in the main prose too. I you know it, it it got a whole sentence, but absolutely. <laughs> so the judges, that was a recommendation from them to take a percentage, a refundable percentage, directly to the courts. Mike, I don't know if you want to address that, but but no, mostly because California doesn't really have a a model for for thinking about it. this. Is what a, a lot of other states allow courts to do this. Um, and I think we thought it made sense here is because, okay, there's going to be some circumstances where cash bail is going to be imposed. And if that's the case, the court should just have flexibility instead of just saying, you, know, you either have to pay this full amount, but you know, either just to have more flexibility um, instead of it being a binary, you're, you got to pay this full amount or we're not, I'm not going to impose it at all. The court can say, you don't have to pay anything, but if you don't show up, you're going to be on the hook for the rest, or I think you should pay, you know, some percentage of it just to, um, make cash bail less onerous, which I think um, I assume everyone on the committee would agree is would be something to eliminate. But because of the situation with Prop 25 and all this, we're um, in this situation now where we kind of have to live with it to a degree. I think so. It's to try and to I, remove some of the sting. And I just want to add that you know, to some you know, some people believe that it's you know remains an important incentive to get to people returned to court, but it shouldn't be a barrier for getting people out. Right, so a court could say, uh, "You're you're on the hook for fifty thousand dollars or whatever it is, um, but you don't have to pay up front to get out. But you're, that fifty thousand dollars is still incentive." And I believe that it was Justice Moreno who said that this is this is the practice in federal court, right? Federal yep. court, you don't you don't pay up front, you just right. have, but you are on the hook if you don't show up, which gets people out from behind bars, which is the main piece. Um, and then if they don't show up, then they, then they, you know, this is an incentive to return. Um, Judge Espinoza. I'm using the raise hand function. No, it's all right. I appreciate it. I'm proud that I know how to do that now. <laughs> um, but I, I, I want to just, um, I want to, uh, I want us to consider a, an additional recommendation regarding the creation of supportive service models in counties to um, support people who are coming out of the jail um, to make sure that we reduce their recidivist behavior and ensure that they get to court. The, the CASA model, I think, is a good example of that. And I would like us to think about moving that work outside of the traditional county departments that have, that have done that work, including the probation department. Now, this may not be the time and place for that conversation, but it seemed to me that maybe uh, we should have a recommendation along those lines. I don't want to take up a full on rec new recommendation. I don't think that that's really, however, um, it's not, you know, it's, it's certainly recommendation adjacent. And I think that we can, um, you know, refer to those pretrial services that have been particularly successful. Tom, what do you think? Well, to be candid, it's a very fraught issue. Um, and I think it was something that we, uh, explored a lot when putting the sort of the bail meeting together and the, the legislature has, has uh, recently given a lot of funding to probation departments to do that kind of work and that's still sort of um, we we're basically told the MOUs were just the ink is still drying on the contract so you know this issue is 
a huge moving target, and that seemed um, particularly moving. Um, and it was a bit hard to, it, we just sort of cut it off from the meeting because it would have just added a lot of complexity and, and additional things. But I think it's definitely something it's super important, something that the committee might want to consider looking at. But um, we, we were trying to be a little intentional and in, in not delving into it because there is a, a lot of a diverging opinion about the best way to deliver those services and things I, like that. So, so here's I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna finish my comment by saying, that I think there's significant evidence in, in Los Angeles County that providing supportive services to people who are released pretrial has been immensely successful, not only in, in ensuring court appearances, but reducing recidivist behavior. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and and I'll, let the, I'll let the staff decide when and how we should address that further. I, I, I second that we can refer to the success of pretrial services without, I, I, and also I agree with Tom with getting it, without getting into who should provide those services, whether or not it should be probation or not. That's really when it gets quite fraught, but that we can just cite that these are successful pretrial programs that ensure um, more compliance with um, returning to court and improvement of public safety. Does that make sense, Tom? I, th I think so. Um, there is also some dispute about how those success rates are re reported. We, we can try to figure that out. Um, it's it, it ends up being quite complicated, but I think the core idea is that um, those pretrial support services, that model is, is the ideal model. That's what New Jersey has done. That's what um, New York has done to a large degree, uh, other places that we looked at. Um, but I wonder if just if, if, if we'd have to be so generic that it's almost like, you know, how do we, um, we're, it's not adding much, much value. Um, but I think we, we can continue to, to take a look at it. But I, I, but I, I think the evidence is very clear that that is the right model to do, but how it's played out in California and who to cite, it, it just, I'm just being totally candid. It gets very um, fraught almost immediately. <laughs> One of the things is, as as everybody I think is quite aware, is that the bail issue has been so politically fraught in California over the past five plus years that we really wanted to make a recommendation that could pass, right? That was a significant improvement on what we what we have, and that we thought that following Humphrey and just saying this is a a pretty straightforward implementation of Humphrey, which is not being implemented con consistently, that Humphrey leaves. Um, a lot of um, issues, like example, how do you determine ability to pay without explicit direction um, for the legislature to take up? And I think that Justice Cuellar uh, essentially said that uh, today. Um, and we thought that that would be the, the most effective use of our time for this recommendation. The piece that's clearly outside of Humphrey is the idea for the California to adopt what I'll call the federal model about being able to, um, for the courts to be um, responsible for, for um, bail and not charging the full 10% um, that commercial bail bonds services pay. That That's admittedly not part of Humphrey, um, but I think makes a, a ton of sense, reduces the financial inequality, and also reduces this, this problem, the, the financial extraction that's going on where people don't even get that money back um, unless, uh, even if they uh, appear and do everything that they're supposed to do. And this would allow the courts to do to take care of that themselves, which would um, not be a financial hit to somebody, even if they required, if they do everything that's required of them. All right. But, uh, Go ahead. It also may, that portion would also be the hardest thing to pass. Um, well, I, th I still think it's a good idea. Um, yeah, and it's, no, it just, <laughs> I agree. We should have it in the report. It should be in the recommendation. And it's certainly severable from the others. Well, I mean, you know, we've talked about, well, why did this measure, you know, what, why did the referendum succeed? And I mean, look, referendums succeed easily because they're counterintuitive. You're voting the reverse way that you, right. so that's one reason. And secondarily, the, I mean, the the discussion was much less around that either the public safety or that criminals would be let out. It was uh, 
and I'm talking about in the legislature. And it was very much more about the um, influence of the bail industry. And this is, you and know, the risk assessment tools. I mean, let's, we can't pretend like the, the no campaign on the, on the ref or the referendum had was just by the bail industry. Right. I, right. Lex Stepling is one of my best friends. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so we know very clearly where some of the other grassroots opposition were. And so I think as we, we touch this again, and then Hertzberg tried to touch this again at the 11th hour at the end of session last year, which I would not have done um, that way, but that was in the, uh, the refundable component of this. So I, I am glad that that conversation about the courts has been included in these recommendations. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I would prefer that to kind of a, a refundable um, component that involves the bail industry still. Um, I think there's a lot to go here. I think the CASA model, I think is also, you know, I know we're at the 11th hour and so adding additional recommendations, but I think some of the things that Judge Espinoza hinted on are important. There is good work happening in LA. There's an entire new department going up that's trying to figure out what its legs are in this space. Um, and so I think to some degree, the state has to be responsive to some of that. Um, I think that that, that makes uh, sense. And like I said, I, I think that we can figure out a way to, in our recommendation, um, cite or refer to some of these uh, successful pretrial services models, even if just to say that, um, you know, it's something that we are keeping our eye on um, as part of this discussion. Uh, on terms of the, um, you know, to the referendum, it, it's it's the law right now. So it's what we're we're stuck with. This is an opportunity to, um, I think, makes makes a lot of sense to the extent that we agree that um, financial incentives to return to court are not only legally remain in the system, but may actually work. That this allows courts to have some flexibility to say that you don't need to pay the full amount. We'll take we will. Uh, take care of that, and um, we'll still charge you if you don't show up. If we agree that that's the you know that's the whole purpose of cash bail in the first place. All right. With that said, I think that we've gone through all the recommendations. Um, I'm not going to uh, reiterate the um, the comments, but I but I've taken notes. Uh, Tom and I believe other staff have taken notes. Um, are there any final comments that we'd like to make a, as a group? I think that we're kind of unanimously agreed that the comments and recommendations that we've made today should be and uh, integrated into the report, which we will do. Any final Incredible comments? Incredible work. Incredible yeah. work is all I have to yeah, add. I, I just want to echo that. I think it was just fantastic, very well written, very thorough, and uh, in, my, in my view, very, very clear as to what our recommendations were. I initially had some hesitation but reading the report, it seemed very persuasive. So I'm, I'm all with the report. Thank you. Senator Skinner? Um, you know, Tom, I'll, I'll um, interact with you, but the, uh, our opening section, there was um, some language that I think could benefit with a little massaging, uh, just given who, you know, that we're gonna have lots of different um, constituencies who read it and we obviously want to have as much um, open-mindedness as possible when people do read our report. So there, I'll just make some suggestions. You can uh, uh, wordsmithing or not, whether you agree, just to help with that. Excellent. I'm sure. I'm sure we'll agree. You, you can. I'll, I'll give you the Google Doc. You can make them. You just put them right in. <laughs> well, and, and thank you all for the kind words. And really, it was uh, Rick and Joy who who have not uh, uh, appeared on screen yet today, who did so much of the work. So um, it's very nice for you all to say that. We, we thank you. <laughs> it was incredible, and it's been going on for a year, and it's a year's effort. So th thank you. Thanks, you know, to Rick, Joy, and Tom in particular. Okay. Uh, speaking of which year's effort, I'm going to turn to 2023, um, next next year. Um, so I want to discuss the committee's plans for the upcoming year. I've been talking with staff over the past several weeks about areas that we should explore, and we're going to hear a very brief presentation from Tom about proposed topics for study. Um, as you'll hear from Tom, the focus is on the meetings of the first half of 2023. Our goal is to give direction to the staff for those meetings earlier in the year so we can have a running start and we'll fill the second half of 2023 as we get as we get going with that being said tom please take it away sure does this look okay to everybody any issues yeah. just let me know okay 
So this will be very short. Um, it's kind of ridiculous I had a cover page actually. But so the, the, the topic, so um, as Mike said, we, we've not filled out the full year. We typically have this meeting in January. Instead of having a standalone meeting, we thought we'd do it now, but that means we haven't quite uh, have thoughts for the entire year. But the things we're, we, we've, we've spoken about with Mike that seem like fruitful things for us to look at is, um, you know, checking it. This is the first bullet, checking in on recent reforms. So 2023 will be our fourth full year. Um, and it seems like there's been enough time to check in, not just on things that have resulted from recommendations from this committee, but, you know, other things that the legislature and the, and the governor have done recently, like, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked, where do we need more data, too early to tell, sort of a, a big um, look at, at some of those things, you know, in particular, uh, recommendations this committee made about the gang enhancement and uh, SB 81, Senator Skinner's bill on 1385 and sentencing enhancements. Let's see what's, what's happened with those, if, if we can tell. Uh, the second bullet is to look at common offenses and dispositions. So typically, I think we think about um, sentence lengths or, you know, uh, like mental health issues. But instead of doing that, let's look at sp particular offenses and see uh, what issues are coming up with those. So what are the most common misdemeanor offenses and sentences and, and felonies, nonviolent felonies, violent felonies? And I think this will in particular give us a chance to look at um, domestic violence offenses, which are a tremendous number uh, in the system and I think don't necessarily get a lot of attention. And similarly, uh, DUI offenses, which you know the, the judges will tell us <laughs> will take up a, a big part of the docket, but um, and obviously present huge public safety issues, but in a way that's a little bit different than I think we typically look at. And I think we'll, we'll look generally about, you know, what's considered a violent offense, a nonviolent offense, what does that mean? Should those lists, you know, be looked at? Should things be added, tweaked, taken away? So it's an opportunity to look um, more offense-based um, than we typically do. And this third bullet is um, a pretty broad topic that we think of as families in the penal code. So the idea is, uh, you know, so, so much of uh, what we've looked at, as I said, is, you know, sentence length and, and things like that. But let's look at, you know, the effects of uh, our criminal system on families. And, how, and that can mean looking at, you know, offenses uh, that are going to be um, particularly relevant for that population, like, you know, shoplifting, uh, baby formula or diapers, or I mentioned welfare fraud earlier, that might, that might be one too. So offenses that are going to affect that population more, I think we could also look at the rise of um, uh, the number of women going to prison and for longer periods of time and the effect of uh, sentences of incarceration on, on family separation. It's a big topic, but we'll figure out a way to make it uh, digestible and specific, but sort of looking specifically at that. And then, you know, there's obviously room for more. Uh, these are all quite big, but we've, we will have room for more throughout the year. So Mike, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add to, to, to my sort of ramblings there, but. No, I mean, this is not something that we are, are setting in stone, except that we should have our first meeting absolutely to, agreed upon. And I uh, I think that there's a lot of um, good reason to revisit uh, reforms and make sure that their implementation um, are going as intended. Um, I guess I'm curious to hear if other people have ideas. Again, we do not have to agree on anything right now, but there'd be areas for the for the committee to for staff to look into preliminarily and come back to us as to um, other topics for study. Senator Skinner. Um, I think it's worth it to look back at some of our recommendations that were not implemented yet, mm -hmm. were not taken up. And one of the ones I was thinking about was, and I think I'm remembering this correctly, that we recommended a second look at people who had been serving, uh, you know, long periods of time, and that hasn't really been taken up. And I thought it might be worth it to revisit it to see if we could add some structure onto that recommendation that might um, help it uh, uh, be more, I don't know, I guess, acceptable or less threatening from a public safety point of view. I've just been struck by the um, many recent reports of people who served, have been serving really long sentences. And I mean, uh, Mike, for example, I'm on your email list and you send us updates when, you, uh, when your lawyers are 
uh, able to get people successfully released, relooked at the parole board or whatever. And when you look at some of the crimes that re that led to them being in prison for as long as they have, it's you know it's hard it's hard for people to imagine how how the heck did anybody get in you know end up being in prison that long for the kinds of things that are described in you know in your in the cases that you all have worked on. And then, of course, there's the recent article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine about Judge Klein and the particular, uh, the woman who was, you know, convicted as a juvenile, where it would appear the, uh, the social work or mental health assessments that were done for her were not, never really factored in. So anyway, so I was thinking that we might be able to add some more, um, a little more boundaries or content to that recommendation if we explore it a little more. Yeah, I agree. And just to add to that, um, I think Washington, D.C. just passed the universal second look um, statute, which is pretty much what we recommended, which is after 10 years, people can come back. I mean, I know it's just a city, but anyway, I think it's an important one. And you had sort of briefly alluded to this, and I don't know if you want to wade into um this is, you know, we've made recommendations on parole that have not gone anywhere. Um, so there is a way that we could go and revisit old um, recommendations that have not gone and to see how we might develop them further. I think that's a worthy idea. Yeah. Okay. And then it's the, you know, overall schedule. Um, I think what we'd propose is basically what we did this year, except one less meeting. Uh, so we had six meetings total, and that included a meeting in January and this meeting, and then four um, meetings with topics. And I think next year we'd go for five, four meetings with topics, and then this meeting at the end of the year to approve the report. And we'd suggest starting you know, early next year in February, late February or March, and start with the reform check-in and just sort of uh, kick off the year with a, a look back <laughs> of, of where uh, things have been. And that's it. So that's what we're thinking. Any additional thoughts? Yeah, and, and, yes. and we're not ironing out all the topics now, but but one of the things that I constantly think about uh, is the, the intersection of the criminal legal system and poverty. And we, we think about it on the front end side of, you know, what what penal codes kind of directly target the conditions of poverty, but we don't often think about it uh, on the reentry side. Uh, when it comes to, to supervision, I know Sydney Kamlager had a gate money bill this year, things like that, um, that, you know, I, I think those are still salient topics for, for folks around California. I, I agree. I think that that makes a lot of sense, too. We talk, we've talked about it in terms of uh, the intersection with mental health issues and race. Um, and these are obviously, you know, overlapping on the Venn diagram. But crimes of poverty, I think, is probably a lens that we should probably, you know, think more about. Yeah. I think that ties in a little bit to the the family topic too, but that's a that's sure. A and the common and the common offenses one, which I think that we're going to find that the most common offenses are crimes of poverty. Yeah, it's all one big topic, <laughs> which is why the committee exists. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think that would take us to public comment. But Mike, do you want to take a break before we do that, or should, or sure? Sure. <laughs> Let's take a five. Is that a hint? Let's take a seven minute break and reconvene at uh, 1130 and then we'll move to public comment and then vote on take the formal vote on whether or not to uh, adopt the recommendations with the suggestions that we've made today. So we'll reconvene at uh, 1130. Thank you. <laughs> 